are moral documents. The reason why we call them moral documents is because they let you know what is the intent of a uh, government or in any case any financial body because we have different tiers in our government from state, center, uni union territories and uh, municipal corporations and uh, the kind of data that they publish is always in the future. So they propose for 2017-18 they will propose a budget and that budget is basically then uh, released by the center to other uh, lower or, uh, financial organizations. And uh, so the kind of data that you get is for this year you get a proposed budget and for last year's budget you get a revised estimate which is not act your actual spend but it's kind of a revised of approximate spend. And for last to last years you get the actual expenditure. So you have a two years lag and the reason why, the, why that exists is there's an audit cycle that happens uh, each year that it's supposed to take around nine months, uh, but it usually ends up taking uh, a year or a year and a half. And it's, sadly, it's all manual. So if it were being automated, then it would be really helpful, but you know. And uh, so all these documents, they're published by different uh, financial bodies uh, separately. So the state governments publish their data on their own web portals and uh, municipal corporations again publishes their data on different web portals and similarly you will have different web portals coming from union territories to districts and uh, the reason, I mean with that diversity you kind of get around 150 plus uh, websites that, websites or web portals that you kind of need to get the data from. And uh, the thing is, the data that you get, again, is in PDF format. <laughs> so the reason why PDFs don't work is the only way I can use PDF data to analyze something is uh, either copy-pasting from uh, there. And uh, that is also if you're lucky, because if it's a scanned image, then you can't even do that. And it's, it won't be even searchable. So we... and. Well, and with 150 plus uh, different domains, there's no consistency of formats. And it's like, so you get uh, data from, it looks some things like this, which is, this is Karnataka's budget. I'm not sure if it's very visible, but yeah, this, there are lines here that separate the columns, which is fairly tabular. And uh, then you get something like this, from West Bengal, which they don't have any uh, particular lines or separating columns or rows. They do have separators, but uh, they indi indicate kind of groups of spend expenditure. And uh, then you have Gujarat, which is multilingual in nature, and you uh, this is in Gujarati and English at the same time. And uh, well, the resolutions are also different across different PDFs. And uh, so you get a mix of different languages and uh, different uh, structures. I mean, they, they, they're not common across any of them. So this leads to uh, the kind of data that we're getting. So to describe the algorithms that we've built or worked on, we're going to divide all the uh, PDFs into two categories, which are uh, table. PDFs with table boundaries and PDFs without any table boundaries. So the idea behind uh, extracting data from table boundaries is quite simple, that you somehow need to detect uh, the lines that separate the columns and the rows. And uh, once you have that, then you kind of uh, figure out what are the table boundaries. And from that, again, you just simply somehow need to pass uh, all that information into a CSV. Now, the first step to both of the algorithms is reading a PDF page into a image. So we use uh, convert, which is from Im 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 image magic, and we pass the density parameter to kind of have a uniformity across all the PDF pages that we are passing. And you just pass the PDF uh, file path, the page number, and the image file that where you want to store. 
and we use sub process to kind of get the shell output and directly uh, read the files. So once you read it, we convert it into a grayscale to make it easy to process. Okay, one question: Is it all visible? Correct, or is it just me? Yeah, slightly problematic, but okay. So I'll try to explain what it looks like if uh, needed. So this is Karnataka's budget and uh, very well separated. And uh, the way we draw lines is uh, we use an algorithm called half lines. The, so there's a slight uh, requirements for half, half transforms or half lines is you need edges. So from this PDF, we kind of need to extract edges that are possibly lines. And the way we uh, draw edges is uh, we use a Kenny, uh, Kenny edge detector. You can also use uh, adaptive thresholding if required. But yeah, this is something what it uh, looks like. So all the major lines uh, get uh, like, you, you get the text edges plus the lines, and uh, from this, uh, you pass this to half transform. And uh, the way half lines uh, works is, so for each edge, so if you see this moving graph, so all dots are edges, it's gonna draw a line. And from each, for each line, it uh, draws uh, values in a very different space. So lines, what we call are in an XY plane. So what half transform does is converts it into a parametric plane, which is uh, distance by distance from the center and the angle at which they are. So for each point, what it's representing is uh, how far it is from the uh, so source and uh, what angle it is. So as it keeps on uh, repeating itself for each edge, uh, it's gonna draw a line and for that line it uh, draws a uh, value. And it does a voting system where it kind of, uh, the highest voted ones are the most probable lines. But uh, half lines per se, it gives you a combination of these parametric spaces. So if you see these values, this is a p-value, how far it is and the degree at which it is. But, uh, and, <laughs> So we use something called half lines P, which directly gives you the lines uh, of where it, they are, rather than just the points. So it figures out what are the most probable lines and it gives you those uh, x, y uh, points, or actually two points. So this is what something it starts uh, looking like. But uh, as you can see, these are quite incomplete in nature. So we do a cleanup exercise where we figure out what the table boundaries and uh, what uh, we kind of extend these lines. And after that, you get a proper structured format of an overlay of the table. So well, we have uh, most of the things. Now, only thing that we need to is pass this table of, uh, table of information of uh, tables and the columns where they are into uh, CSVs. So we, for this particular method, something called Tabula, which is an open source tool, which uh, kind of makes this very easy for us. So you just pass the page, page number, which is pages, and then you say the area, which is the table area, and the columns. Uh, so these are geometrical points where the columns are, and that gives you the CSV. And the way you read it outputs the CSV into uh, the shell. Again, you, you, use, you just use sub process to uh, get the CSV and then write. But uh, the problem with this is you, uh, it doesn't take uh, rows as an input. So you don't have, uh, your rows end up sometimes being uh, combined, or combined together or, and your titles and everything. So but the documents are not uh, very uh, structured, so you kind of get some odd results at times. And also the limitation is that this method only works with where you actually have lines as a separator. 
to so I'm actually moving quite fast so in case someone has a question you can point out and uh, so extracting table without boundaries so I'm gonna do an exercise I kind of want everyone to participate in this so I just want to to point out uh, whether this looks like a table or not and uh, this one uh, slightly louder because I can't <laughs> okay and uh, this one so the, the reason why we can easily see through this is because we understand patterns really well and as humans we can figure out how the relative distances are and what kind of structure it's being form and, uh, forming and we can recognize whether it is a table or not and we also recognize where the table would break or might not break given other details so but how do we let a machine kind of understand these same things uh, the way we do it is we need to somehow extract geometrical features and to extract geometrical features we first convert we need something like a block structure where we can help the machine see it's just not text it's these are blocks of text and uh, for that we used initially at that time we used something called an RLSA which is stand for run length uh, smoothing algorithm the way it works is for each it, it goes from one uh, one pixel to another and it checks a threshold of values and if it's a uh, one it converts that zero into one and uh, if it's not it keeps it as zero so imagine it being run on a lot of the text and uh, to do it in a 2D structure, we, uh, I did, we did site uh, modification that we checked a matrix rather than just a line in front of it. So then you start getting something like a uh, block structure like this. But the problem with this is it took uh, around 50 seconds because well, not the best coder. <laughs> so an alternative to this is uh, morphological operations which are again part of OpenCV and what you can do is a simple dilute and it actually gives you if you see a much more cleaner results it doesn't have all the edges being marked so once you have this you now we need to kind of have uh, geometrical separations uh, some information on how we can separate them or draw patterns and the way we do that is something called uh, component with stats so component with stats uh, it's going to pick for each white block that you see it's going to pick uh, it's going to figure out what is its uh, left most point what is the top most point and the width and the height and area and uh, centroid so with this information you can actually add a slight more information which is uh, right and bottom and you kind of get uh, for each uh, block you get all the geometrical information with this geometrical information now you can start seeing patterns by just grouping numbers if you group uh, all the left side you will be able to see all these left aligned parts they are in the same uh, column and with these you can estimate where the columns are and similarly for rows now so but this information is not enough to pass the PDF. So the reason why we want to pass it not using tabula is one, and one and only, it didn't work. Um, so tabula needs lines. If you don't have lines, it's not able to pass it correctly. And uh, so we need to kind of build a custom parser for this. And to build that, we need to do something called as uh, layout analysis. Now, by layout analysis, we mean that we need to figure out where the headers are or where the values are and even the empty cells and something called uh, groupings. By groupings, I mean uh, the left text around the values. You need to kind of, we call them groupings because, well, in pandas, if you do a group by, you kind of get the aggregations. So it's just a coin term that we use. So to convert the text from PDF, uh, we use something called PDF to text, which is an Ubuntu, you have that tool in Linux, not just specific to Ubuntu. But we use a very specific version, which is Poplar's version. 
the reason why I use that is we need text from very particular blocks and very particular geometries. And the way we kind of do it is because we already have the geometrical inf uh, information of the topmost points and the leftmost points. It's easy to kind of get the text, which for each block, we kind of get something like this, where you have the text, text length, and we start adding some more features, which is like, is it comma separated, or is it text, or is it number, and uh, the text length. And uh, so I've limited these columns, so you actually have for each row, you have a whole set of geometrical features, plus its uh, textual attributes now. And based on these, now we start, uh, we start marking these with numbers, headers, titles, groupings, which was our initial agenda to pass these PDFs into uh, CSVs. And the way we do is we have currently built rules around this since we don't have much data around how we can automate this. Uh, so for numbers, it's easy to detect numbers. If it's convertible by convertible to a number, uh, it's, easy. it's very simple. And for headers, we kind of make uh, all the headers should have at least 70% of the values below it as uh, numbers. So if you look at hmm, this one. So all these are headers, and most of the values that you'll see below this will be numbers. And the 70% we come up with is 70% uh, of the table itself, not the page. The reason we do that is because you kind of get a multi-tabled page. So it would have two or three tables uh, at times on the page. And similarly, we kind of check titles. Titles are the easiest. Like you just need to detect which is center aligned and has a very huge area compared to others. And for, to do relative comparing, we kind of just calculate z-scores, which is, if you don't know, you can just simply how far it is from the mean. It just figures out what is the average and how far it is. And based on those numbers, you kind of sort out and figure out which are the titles. And uh, similarly, groupings is, uh, it should have all the values on the right of it should be uh, numbers. So it does not work completely because as you can see, you kind of get NANs and everything. The reason for that is, I mean, you don't need to make it perfect. You just need it to run. and. Uh, the reason you get NANs and everything because uh, groupings can be multi-level groupings. So it will detect one and another might not be detected. So you kind of get a mix of uh, NANs and groupings. So yeah, beyond this, we kind of just do a passing of uh, where we go by row by row and we generate row indexes, column indexes, and just convert those column and row indexes into tables. But the thing is, uh, Rules do not scale, and with my past experience, tried it with NLP tools, and uh, I, tried, I tried it here too. I know it will fail, and uh, even though it might work for some, it's still gonna fail for most of them. So, the point is, how do you get ready to automate these things or become machine learning uh, ready? The way we are doing it is we are generating metadata. Uh, using logging. So we log all the raw images and all the blocked images, and then the features that we've generated, which look, start looking something like this. You have the area, bottom, centroids, and this is for each block. And then you kind of have uh, the, this is, and uh, the outputs, obviously the CSVs, and uh, using these, these gives you opportunities to do some crazy stuff like, uh, now, given the text and the uh, information that I have for each block, so I have the text that it has, and uh, I have the geometrical positioning of it. I can build a small Bayesian model just because just with a small data set, which would have priors of, uh, let's say, where we'll be able to estimate if some uh, label lies at the center and its uh, values are numbered, then it's most probably a number value rather than of being a header, header, header or a grouping. And similarly, the left aligned would be the groupings. And so these are like try, trying to build an intelligence into a system. And uh, another thing that uh, we still plan to do is, well, can we convert directly from image? Can we generate the markings? 
which is a very good uh, use case for RNNs and CNNs. And but we are still generating the data, and uh, as most of us would know, that it takes a lot of data to train a neural net. So I mean, before I move forward, like uh, kind of just try to emphasize of why we are doing this. So recently, uh, there was a study by NDTV. Uh, I don't remember the exact thing, but. So Gujarat has been uh, reducing its spend uh, for health healthcare by from in the last three years it has reduced from 5.6 percent to 5 percent only, and uh, most of it is focused on uh, rural or only in the rural areas or I mean, not the rural areas sorry it focused on the urban areas, which is a problem. And uh, if we can figure out and analyze these kind of problems at early, it's easier to kind of uh, ask your government or what you're doing, start questioning and start kind of help bringing a change in the system. So this is a, we at, op I mean, at Open Budgets India, which is the organization that I'm working with, we believe to build an open uh, environment. So all our research to all our code is open source. And we believe in open by default uh, ideology. So we've been trying to make all these research kind of open. And the things that where we found out that we are lacking is more like lab manuals, if you remember, from colleges or schools. Like reproducibility is one, that the, and doc, uh, understandability and collaborativeness. So to for reproducibility, what we are trying to do is have all the data sources at least on a web portal, which is very common, if you see, in the tech area, but not so common in the research area. And uh, understandability is documentation. So IPython notebooks is probably one of the best things to use. And for collaborativeness is, we use GitHub. So issues, discussions, everything goes into GitHub. This is how we are trying to build a culture for open research. And the plus points of this is the research ha need not be complete to be published. It's, the, it's more like ideas need to be shared. And we would like kind of have uh, like contributions from most of people uh, present here. So you can kind of help us generate more open data. Uh, you can pick up the algorithms that we have or the iPython notebooks that we have and you can try it out with your own uh, data. And in case you kind of have problems doing that, you can always uh, reach out to us on GitHub or send us a mail uh, from at openbudgetsindia.org and help us improve our algorithms and code base. We need a lot of help on that. <laughs> so uh, it's majorly because we, there's a lot of work to be done because even with we have 150 plus sources of PDFs, we only have around, uh, let's say, five uh, states and a lot of unit territories, I mean, most of the unit territories and around 50 or so municipal corporations. But even with that, we have around uh, 7,000 to 8,000 CSVs on our portal. <laughs> and there's a lot more to be passed. <laughs> and uh, so e even if you're interested, you can do studies like, uh, let's say, how census and budget is comparing uh, like maybe child mortality and what investments are gov the government is proposing during this year and how it has been proposed in the last few years. So you can do all those analysis also and uh, we can help you with that. Or you can just simply uh, help us uh, by giving pointers or feedbacks or new ideas about our designs, methodologies or the code itself. We <laughs> and yeah. I would, yeah, open for questions. Yes. So uh, how do you measure the accuracy? Like, no, because these are different documents. It is not that you have yeah. uh, so many with the same format that you can really take it and do it, but it is going to be very difficult to measure 
whether the, my, the whole process is working fine, I'm extracting the right values, right? Yeah. So how do you approach? So currently we are doing it manually. We have a validation team that sits and does it. But ideally, there is a paper on how to do validation on layout analysis alone, uh, what kind of metrics you should be considering. So maybe that would be a good read to go through. OK, thanks. Hi, my name is George. Um, I w I'm part of a company that builds automation for enterprise companies. Uh, we're called Siroco. So we actually deal with this problem a lot. So first off, I want to thank you for presenting on it. Um, I think what a lot of people probably don't appreciate here without having worked on this is what comes from the previous question as well, which is how important being correct is. So if you're handling a, an insurance document and you get one number wrong, I mean, you're really hosed, right? Yeah. And so, um, so it's actually very important. And I just want to you know, bring up a, one other thing and then ask you a question. So some of the other things that we run into a lot when trying to deal with documents like this are tables inside of tables, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, that constantly throws us off. And finally, if you have any thoughts on, sometimes things are laid out as if it's a table, like at the top of a document, you might have an address and your name and then a phone number. It looks like a table, it's kind of implicitly a table, but it's not in the sense that it's not labeled like there's a name next to it. So just your thoughts on that as well, and thanks. Yeah, so to answer the first part of it, uh, well, table inside tables, the only way I can think of is uh, initially building rules to detect uh, whether it kind of create a row where saying a uh, table number or a table index. That's how we have been also doing it. So the way we have it is in one page, you kind of have sometimes two or three tables. And the way we handle it is, uh, just have table indexes. And there would be cases where the outer table is supposed to be a higher level grouping also, which is also another case that we hand, handle, is uh, we take the margins of how far it is, and we kind of, once we know that it is more, most probably a grouping, uh, once you know that, it's easy to kind of figure out based on how, what is distance from the left side of it. And yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, hi. Um, first of all, great talk. I mean, partly because uh, tables contain huge amounts of information that we need to extract. And uh, the thing is, the PDFs are necessarily evil. I mean, it's, it's really difficult to extract information from them. Yeah. Uh, my question is, how are you exactly detecting the borders for an unbordered table? As yeah. in, you don't. So OK, the way we do it is, for our case, is uh, tables are generally separated by titles. That's the pattern that we have seen. Okay. Because in budget documents, they need to specify what budget code, which is under which category that uh, below information lies. Correct. So we detect those titles as table endings and startings. So if it weren't for budgets, then if it was some other kind of table, then it might fail in that case. Yes. So these rules are very specific to okay. budgets alone. That's why, let's say, encoding text uh -huh. might help to ex ex use it in other formats. But okay. again, we need to generate the data to kind of build models on that. Okay. So that's where we are aiming for. And okay. all these data would be open. All right. Okay. So yeah, you can kind of use it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, here. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned, and maybe you already saw this, but uh, you mentioned uh, with respect to Gujarat's data, I think it's multilingual and stuff. Yes. Uh, are you concerned about the I mean, actual text itself, or do you don't do you not care about the content? Just go for the layout, and you don't figure out what the content is, so how to translate it, and stuff. So, being in civic technology, the outcomes are a lot more important to me, uh, to us, because getting it correct is very very important. Because you might just if you kind of miss a row, and those values are in some other row. Uh, it can mess up an analysis right. because that's what we are aiming for too. And uh, again, it's that's why we have a validation team that just does that for us right now. And as far as multilinguality is concerned, uh, that is an experiment that I have to start. So everyone is kind of welcome to uh, join us on that. We'll push everything to GitHub and we can have discussions on that. Um, so the way we are uh, planning to handle multilingual system is most of the documents, uh, the other language is mostly Hindi. 
and uh, maybe we can build a corpus around because there are documents that has English and Hindi both, and there are documents that have just Hindi alone. So if we can build a corpus around English to Hindi translation, it's a very far-fetched goal, I would say. But yeah, coming years maybe. <laughs> One step closer. Hey, uh, who's the end consumer, and how do they use the output of your? That's a, that's a very good question. So the end users for this particular uh, tool is uh, technologist who wants uh, kind of explore budget, but the end users of the CSVs are budget researchers who explicitly work on analyzing budget data regularly as part of their jobs. And uh, other than those. Uh, we are building tools where the people, I mean, a normal citizen can also uh, kind of get there and search for, let's say, hospitals, and you get information for hospitals across uh, states. So those tools are kind of our next year's next year's plan. So right now we have something called, uh, I mean, I don't have internet connection, so I can't show. But yeah, we have something called, uh, you can go to openbudgetsindia.org and you have a story generator at the, uh, at the corner, uh, top corner. Uh, there you, th that's the information that we have been uh, sensitized and kind of made it easy to consume. So you can check that out. Okay. Hey, so. uh, hello. Uh, yes. Thanks for the talk. So uh, there were a few questions, uh, specifically a few cases uh, where we need to extract data from tables. The first one that many times your rows span multiple rows and your tables span multiple pa pages. And another question is, um, most of the time, speci uh, specifically